going to talk about how we're going to fight back against the dysfunctional food system. But if we want to know where we have to go, we need to know where we've been, right? The fight over the concentration of economic and political power has been going on in our nation since Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton debated it. And remember who won that fight, Thomas Jefferson. He wrote that it is a human right for people to be free from monopoly power. So how did we end up with four large grocery stores that control 70 to 90 percent of the market in many areas of this country? How did we end up with 20 food processing companies that own most of the brands in the grocery store? How did we end up with 10 fast food restaurants that sell junk food, uh, especially through advertising to children? Well, that story really begins in modern times in the 1970s. Now, you probably know that many of our most environmental laws and many other progressive laws were passed in the early 1970s. And many of the business leaders, the big economic interests of the time, decided that it was time to fight back. And in fact, they wanted to get much larger. So they began to organize their money, and they were successful in the early 1980s in getting rid of those laws that really prevent monopoly power. Those are called antitrust laws. And our antitrust laws had worked pretty well between the 1940s and through the 1970s, and in fact, both political parties uh, during those years had felt that it was important to limit the concentration of economic and political power. But what happened in the early 1980s is that the two agencies that are really responsible for antitrust enforcement were dramatically shrunk, and the definition of what a monopoly is was narrowed. And so since that time, we've seen massive mergers and acquisitions that last even unto this day. And in fact, it's not just in the food industry, it's in every industry, although the food industry is one of the most consolidated. Now, you may say, well, so what? What's that mean to me? Well, unfortunately, when companies get very, very, very large, they also get very, very, very rich. And what's happened since the 1980s is that a lot of industries have had a lot of money to begin influencing federal policy. And in fact, to actually help create the system of legalized bribery today. And in the food industry, that's meant that a handful of food companies have been able to affect just about every food policy that affects you and your family and to affect how food is grown and processed. Now, what happened in the mid-1990s is that this small set of companies that was consolidating was also able to influence a lot of the major decisions that were being made about trade policy at that time. And in fact, what resulted was an offshoring of a lot of our food. So today, about 50% of fruits, 30 to 40% of vegetables are produced overseas. Even China is a large provider of processed fruits and vegetables. And there's a move to move a lot of animal production overseas. Now, I want to talk about the effect that this has had on the way our meat is produced, because I don't think most people know. A lot of people know that animals are produced in these giant factory farms. In the case of chickens, where you have two or 300,000 uh, chickens that are actually squished together in these warehouses. 
But what the industry has been able to do is to influence how those birds are raised. Uh, they own the genetics, they own the feed, they own the, uh, the trucks that pick up the birds and carry them to their slaughter facilities. And they actually view meat inspection as a, uh, uh, an interference with um, having profits. And so the big chicken industry, and I'm talking about companies like uh, Tyson Meat and the giant uh, Brazilian company JBS uh, that owns Pilgrim's Pride and Swift and other corporations, they've been able to influence the way our meat is being processed. And today, they want to slaughter 175 birds per minute. And the way that they deal with all of the waste on that chicken is they then dip it in chemical washes. So everybody looks really bummed out. And I know it seems like these are really massive problems. But we have to figure out how we can break down these big systemic problems. And I would say um, we're going to need to reinvigorate our democracy to do that. But to really uh, reinvigorate our democracy means involving people in these issues and having uh, uh, campaigns that break the issues down into winnable chunks. So I want to talk about three ways that everybody sitting here today can get involved. And it's a, a beginning of how we can start reforming our food system. And I think just by pe more people getting involved, that's going to help build our democracy. So the first issue does address that problem of 175 birds being slaughtered per minute. Now, the USDA is making that decision. And uh, we've been fighting it now for two years. They haven't decided to let it happen yet. We need everybody here today to contact the USDA and tell them that you don't want to eat meat that uh, is uh, dipped in these chemical baths to alleviate the uh, bacteria from the fecal matter that's probably still on the bird. And we make it real easy at Food and Water Watch. You can go to our website at foodandwaterwatch.org on the slider, and it will uh, help you send a message to the USDA. Now, the next issue I want to talk about is um, uh, the issue of antibiotics in meat production. I mean, this is an issue that is going to affect everybody sitting here today or someone that you love. Because today, 80% of antibiotics are being used in meat production to increase uh, production, the, the growth of the animal, and to keep the animals from getting sick because they're all being raised in these uh, very squished, on unsanitary conditions. 80% of antibiotics. Now, what does our doctor tell us? Our doctor tells us uh, to only use antibiotics when we're really sick and need them, and to always finish the dosage. But yet, we're letting animals uh, have this low dosage of antibiotics throughout their lifetime. You know what that means. That means that the, the bacteria that are susceptible to the antibiotics are dying, and that other bacteria are becoming resistant. And that's why we have this growth of antibiotic resistance and infections that can't be treated by antibiotics. And if we continue in this vein, we're going to lose some of our most important drugs. So this is a big campaign. We need to get everybody involved in it. And it's something that you can do in your own community, because this year, we're hoping to pass hundreds of local resolutions in communities around the country uh, saying that, telling the FDA that they should stop this irresponsible use of antibiotics in meat production. We need lots of people involved because uh, the FDA has the power to do this today. They just don't have the political will. Congress could make them do it, but Congress doesn't have the political will either. Uh, we've had legislation introduced in the last five Congresses and have not even been able to get a hearing. 
And this issue is going to affect everyone in the long term. So by using resolutions and a lot of education, we're going to be able to push the FDA to do something like we recently did with arsenic. Uh, we campaigned for several years to get arsenic out of chicken feed. And just three weeks ago, we were successful. Most people don't know that chicken feed had arsenic, but uh, successful campaigns around the country embarrassed the FDA into getting arsenic out of feed, uh, which means that you're not exposed to it and our waterways aren't exposed to it. The third issue that I want to talk about is one that you may not uh, have heard much about. You know, these trade deals that are negotiated in secret, there's usually a lot of uh, corporate power to uh, uh, be able to manipulate the negotiations so that they benefit a, a, a handful of industries, not most people, because of course trade is a good thing. But there are a new set of trade negotiations being debated. One of them is called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. How many of you have heard of the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Not very many. Well, this is going to be an agreement um, with 12 Pacific Rim countries. And um, it's really not so much about trade, even though it's being called a trade agreement because trade agreements are usually about reducing tariffs. This is really about what they call trade barriers. Guess what a trade barrier is? A trade barrier is health uh, regulations, environmental regulations, uh, laws about safety. So this uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that's being negotiated in secret uh, we only know what's in the language because um, some of the documents have been slipped out. This is going to go at the heart of a lot of the protections that we take uh, for granted in this country, our food safety laws that are already being weakened. It could even affect the local food movement because uh, uh, this trade uh, law is going to allow companies to sue governments. It's called uh, uh, investor arbitration, and we have that under the North America Free Trade Agreement. So if your community or your state decides that 20% uh, um, of food sold in the local um, uh, schools should come from the state, that could actually be viewed as a trade barrier. In fact, anything protective could actually be viewed as a trade barrier. So, you know, we're not just fighting about our food system, right? We're fighting about having a real democracy. And I think that that debate that Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton had um, is an important one, and it's one that we need to reinvigorate today because most people aren't talking about the effect that consolidation has on our political system. We want to be able to pass on to our children a healthy planet, a healthy food system. But to be able to do that right, we have to pass on a healthy democracy. We need everybody to get involved in the political system, in elections, in making our elected leaders accountable. And we need all of you young people going to school here to actually think about running for office and getting informed uh, about all of the most important issues of the day. And really, that's the only way that we're going to have a healthy food system and a healthy democracy. Thanks so much.